that's great. And everyone has uh, has kept to time, which means that we have lots of times for question, lots of time for questions and comments. And again, let me just say that we're also uh, welcoming comments and uh, questions from those who are watching online. So let's open the floor for anyone who would like to say something. And could you please identify yourself, name and affiliation if you have one? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Raffaella from uh, Head on Household Energy Network. Uh, my question is, uh, so as I understand, uh, um, Emma is uh, Emmanuel. Are there plans to make uh, a software uh, enabling tool out of it? Sorry, Gabriella. Raffaella. Um, your question is whether or not we would turn it from being a, a paper manual into a actual software. Yeah, or, or electronic or a, copy. They are no, no, no it's an actual. More of a tool, a software tool that takes the user through phases and guides oh, okay. the user. Currently, software application. Currently, we don't have any plans to do that, but that's an interesting concept. We hadn't thought of that. No. So you'd enter the data in, and then it would move you through the phases and automatically draw the maps for you. And OK, well, thank you very much. That's a great idea. <laughs> Currently, no, I, no, no plan to do so there at the moment. We do have a soft copy that's available, though, that's downloadable. And at the back of the manual, there's a CD that has lots of resources on it as well, but no softwares yet. Yes. We hide from London South Bank and practical action. Um, this is probably a, a very naive question, but I'm just interested um, if, if, for example, as happened in Haiti, your perceptions of a particular market system are still changing very fast with every piece of data that comes in, with every interview, with every next interview. Um, how do you decide what's a good point to say, um, I can make an assessment? Um, it's a it's a very good question. Um, in fact, that's why we try to stress that what we're talking about is trends or what you know, big picture. What is the level of priority for, for things, as opposed to, you know, there's no final answer because hopefully every day people recover a little bit, right? Um, one of the things that we did definitely do in Haiti was say, look, somebody needs to look at this issue and this issue a bit more. So flagging those things that you think um, could become concerns. Um, both the construction labor and the CGI groups found that actually the construction market was at a standstill during the time that we were doing it because they were waiting for signals. Um, are, are people going to be buying a lot? Because we don't have any contracts right now. And that was both the... Um, suppliers as well as like the big construction firms who hadn't lost their equipment did have capacity but they're like we're waiting for the contract you know so we had to put in recommendations that said please keep paying attention to this can, can i add something to that i don't know whether mike wants to too but i think every assessment is a snapshot yeah i mean that's true of all true. assessments you're taking a picture at that moment in time what is absolutely crucial is the monitoring that can follow on from that so that you are managing to update your information as it comes in. And as you do so, you should be able to adjust your recommendations accordingly and change your interventions if need be. And that's one of the things that I think Mike has also developed, which is part on the, it's on the CD, isn't it, is a monitoring yes. tool <clears throat> that should help you to try and keep your, your information as up to date and as current as possible so that you can inform donors, inform your program, et cetera, et cetera. Which you would want to do anyway as, as just good programming. Well, yeah. yeah. In fact, that was one of the weaknesses. I should have mentioned that in um, my, my little blurb, that monitoring in markets is actually one of the, again, another challenge that I think we face in, in NGOs. We kind of know what we should be doing, but don't quite know why or what we should be looking for and understanding what it means. What does it mean if the prices go up or go down? What, what is it trying to tell us? So we need to learn how to, to understand a bit better what we're looking for. Leslie. Um, I think this is a fantastic thing. And so Sorry, well, can you just identify? I've yeah. identified you, sort of. But <laughs> just uh, okay. complete that. Leslie Adams, independent. 
party. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think this is absolutely superb because it's the cul culmination of multi-agency organisational collaboration. It's the private sector coming together with the the not-for-profit sector when you're actually doing this work and you're getting development players around the, f the table as well as relief people. So hopefully you, you're going to be br bridging those big gaps to do with the relief development divide that hampers a lot of good planning. Um, I'm interested in finding out whether you've, uh, you're able to um, make organisations use this tool or make them have some kind of analysis. And after disasters, very often it's the coordinating bodies which can choose to ignore the issue of market um, recovery. So I'm wondering what your experience was in Haiti to do with the cluster coordination groups and whether you've actually, you can actually develop something a bit like with the, hap the humanitarian accountability partnership. So agencies sign up and then it's on their agency as a a gold standard for their quality of their programming. But you know, what, what, what was your experience in Haiti to do with making sure people don't make plans for bringing in all this mm. stuff before they even find out what, the, what your results were? Yeah, I think that's part of the reason that we had so many people at the report out, because <laughs> people recognized they wanted this information. Um, and they were thrilled that it was widely available. And um, um, <coughs> uh, WFP was doing an EFSA, an early food... Emergency, emergency security assessment. Thank you. I'm bad with acronyms. Mm -hmm. um, it was doing an EFSA that overlapped with the EMMA by one week. And we were, we luckily had a WFP person on our team. So we had coordination like, oh, you're covering that. Okay, good, because EMMA won't cover that. And, and these kind of things. And we know that, um, we also had OFDA and ECHO both at the um, report out. And, and I think it really comes from that point. I mean, OFDA has put so much um, resource into this because they like, we want to know that we're funding good programs. So I think it's ultimately going to come from the donors saying, you have to do an assessment before you do a program, you know. Um, and, and so I, I think it will actually come quite naturally, both because we did a lot of work with the humanitarian, you know, the NGO community to say, what do you want the tool to be able to provide? And, and tried to hold that up against what, um, you know, what the donors were saying they wanted. Um, uh, so I, I think it's in there, and, and I meant to, I meant to say this when I was uh, presenting before. Um, not only do we have OFDA and ECHO there, but um, PDNA, the the assessment that's done by the Haitian government, the World Bank, and the EU, um, has also picked up the reports and is using them in their PDNA. So it, it's getting into the mix. I think we'll get there. I don't know. Did the early recovery cluster, did they show an interest? They were fantastic. Great. Um, okay. Once you finally found the person that you were supposed to be talking to, which was its own challenge, but um, uh, it's, on, that, it's on the cluster website. I was supposed to speak um, uh, very shortly, very briefly, um, uh, at the early recovery cluster, and then it got canceled for reasons beyond our control, but the, the intention was there, yeah. Okay. That's also an area we're going to be looking at in the next... Yeah phase is trying to, to engage with donors a bit more and also with the with the clusters. So I know the shelter cluster's got lots shows lots of interest in using Emma and um, and hopefully the other clusters will show interest as well. We've got um, I think some other people waiting unless it's directly yes. okay well if if the others I don't mind go ahead. It is absolutely imperative if at all possible that you get the shelter cluster on board with other clusters because it's it's a, such a kind of insular cluster that it's very important to they were to also make um, they were actually part of the informant for both the labor group and the CGI group so they were they were at the report out they were involved yes very much okay we I think there's someone over here who'd been waiting for a while is that was that you yeah, yeah. Uh, I had a question uh, I caught half of what you were saying and. Could you identify yourself? My name is Michael Carter, sorry. Um, one of the things I'm uh, starting to understand because I'm on a course uh, looking at um, sort of economic development, and I'm from an economics background, which is mine, uh, the question I have is what is the development community doing to sort of bring about these, and after a disaster situation, to bring about the sort of indicators, I mean, sort of the factors that will create demand. Because it seems like there's a bit, bit of a re, um, reflexive attitude, because it doesn't seem like there is a 
a initiative to make sure that uh, a market has demand driven sort of factors. For example, if a, com a company goes into a new area, they're looking at all the ways, unfortunately this word is going to probably bristle a bit, to uh, sort of exploit the economy within a particular sort of um, uh, amount of uh, goods and services that would be able to hit the ground and be able to generate other sort of um, uh, goods and services that can be implemented into the marketplace. It doesn't seem like there's a, um, or maybe I haven't, I haven't actually read this report, but just in what I've studied thus far, it doesn't seem like there is a, a, a sort of market-driven uh, aspect to being able to make sure that the local economy can have sort of a full structured range of goods and services that will then in turn push development often a lot faster than uh, development communities because if we've noticed historically, communities move faster when they have an initiative to be able to uh, be a part of bringing about a better quality of life. So my very long-winded question is, <laughs> I'm aware of that, um, is, is it, are there sort of uh, movements afoot to be able to maybe add sort of clear economic planning uh, to uh, disaster relief just to ensure that uh, the rule of law will be essentially established often after um, clear sort of economic planning and then to be able to move the sort of communities forward through demand-driven sort of market systems? I don't know if anyone is prepared to answer that question. I I think, I think I'll start and then maybe Carrie can take over. Um, the, the, I mean, the scope of the toolkit was, uh, is and was originally conceived very much as being about starting to get some understanding of market systems into the thinking of humanitarian and relief agencies in the, at the very early stages of an emergency response. So. So if you like, we're starting from a blank page where, where a lot of agencies don't even think about it, or they're beginning to think about it. So the toolkit, the, the, you know, the, the, the toolkit is the, is, is the first, is the foot in the door, if you like, of, getting, of encouraging agencies to think about the role that markets can play in facilitating, first of all, in providing re the, the relief or the responses that, they, the, that they're trying to meet, but secondly, also in thinking beyond the, the relief phase in, and thinking what could we do that would actually facilitate the recovery of the local economy faster. So I don't think the MTO, the MTO is just a foot in the door, if you like. There's a lot of interest in taking, um, you know, in, in market, uh, mas market integrated relief, I think is the, 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 the phrase that has been coined, by, particularly by the, the SEEP network. So there's a lot of interest in, in your question and what's going on, but I think you, you've got to see the EMA toolkit as just the first step in, uh, and it, its audience is, is agencies that, that possibly are f just scared of the idea of going and talking to a trader. Mm. But maybe, Carrie, you can... Um, you know, I, I, with regards to Emma, I, I agree completely. And I would say to answer your question more deeply, I'd, I'd refer you to things like the, the SEEP minimum standards for economic recovery and emergencies, which talks very much about market-driven um, responses as being best practice. Uh, look at Microlinks, um, which has lots and lots of resources about what folks are already doing um, in relation to your question. Um, there, there are a lot of resources out there that can, you know, sort of, your question is very broad and there's a lot of different ways to answer it, but those would be the two places I would recommend you start looking. Now we've got, um, we've got people on both sides of the room, but before I call on you, we've also got a question that's uh, come in from an online watcher. So I, I'm just going to uh, read the question and then let the panelists respond. So this is from Courtney Brown from OFDA. Um, Courtney's asking whether the, saying that the trainings in DC, London, Jordan, and Bali were designed to produce a cadre of potential team leaders that can conduct EMAs. How can organizations access that list of people if they'd like to find a team leader for their EMA? The reason for asking is because there's an organization in Haiti right now who'd like to conduct a second EMA but needs a team leader to do so. Um, thanks, Courtney. Uh, we were just discussing this about an hour ago, <laughs> um, and so the immediate uh, answer—I mean, the immediate answer to the question is—we will send that list to uh, that organisation this afternoon. But um, the, the, the broader the broader response is: we are intending to put this kind of information on the Emma website. 
Um, and also through the Emma website, you can join, or and anyone who's interested in staying in touch with the, the Emma community can join the, the D Group community, uh, which has been set up for Emma as well. So you'll find, basically, you'll find all the answers to that kind of question on the Emma website. Right. No, that's okay. it. That's what I would say. Uh -huh. Okay. Let's start over here, and then um, I'm, each time raise your hands, and I'll, I'll, I think we'll have time for everybody. Thanks. Adrian, Adrian Nance, Wings Like Eagles. I'm just trying to work out how Emma, and I apologize for being late, so you may have covered this. So um, how Emma integrates with the coping strategies that there are on the ground in economic terms. Does the toolkit have the flexibility to both discover and therefore uh, reinforce that which the community that is affected is actually trying to do for itself? rather than just concentrating on whether the NGOs have thought about the economic consequences of their actions. Uh, thank you. Uh, interesting question. I mean, explicitly, yes, the toolkit. In, in the, the first strand that I mentioned, the gap analysis strand, um, is essentially about prompting agencies to, to understand as best they can in, in the time they have available what are the livelihood strategies and the coping responses of the target population. Uh, that might be as simple as finding out what people's preferences are for the form of, sort of relief that they receive, um, but hopefully it goes beyond that and, it, and it, it, it prompts users of the toolkit to understand better how the, you know, what kind of livelihood strategies uh, target population have. There's not often time to do that in the kind of time frame that Emma might be used at, but often that information is there. If people look for it, there may well be, for example, you know, HEA analyses that have been done of target populations or similar populations beforehand. So the, the toolkit prompts users to investigate those kind of questions and try and find out, if only from secondary literature, what the kind of coping strategies are. Okay, there's someone at the back here who's been waiting a long time, please. Thank you. I'm Anne Davies. I'm an independent consultant. And um, I've just come back, actually, from an evaluation of um, British NGOs' uh, action emergency response in Padang. And I was waiting with bated breath to hear what the report from Padang was. I think you were going to talk about that, um, the Emma rollout there. Um, could you give me... No? Was Padang not like one of the... Uh, uh, well, I'll let you finish your Okay. Um, no, I just wanted to know how Emma was um, received there. And what difference did it make to the agencies in their responses, in fact? You're catching me on the hop. Um, I was actually on maternity leave at the time, so um, just casting my mind back. The Emma in Padang, and I think, Mike, you might know more as well, was um, basically looking at uh, construction, so bricks for construction. Mm -hmm. And it was done for the shelter cluster, so they requested this, this information. And it was a rapid assessment done by Rick Bauer in Oxfam, Jonathan Brass, and I think uh, an HSP called Loretto, with other staff, I'm sure. Um, I don't have their names. And um, I, it, I, if I remember correctly, the recommendations were that the brick market could be re-stimulated, and the brick market was predominantly female, uh, employ it was mainly um, it was mainly women who were the brick makers, so the recommendation was to re-stimulate that market and it could provide enough materials. Is that right, Mike? Can you remember more? Is that posted on... I can actually or? send you the yeah, report. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We can send you, you the like report. If you give me your, your email yeah. details, and I can put you in touch with Rick as well, yeah. if you'd like. Well, also, the report is on the... If not on the website directly, it's on the D Group community site, so you can find it <coughs> through the, if you join, the, if you're not already, if you join the D group community, you'll find that report as well as all the other reports. Okay, now we've, I know we've got a lot of questions here and there, but I'm going to take this person here who's been waiting, then we'll come back to you. Thank you. The name is John Grimwood. I'm a member of the South East London Supporters Group for Practical Action. Um, I'd like to pick up um, points made variously already about bridging the gap between humanitarian or disaster relief and development. And my question is really, how does Emma 
um, or the Ember approach differ according to whether markets were or were not functioning efficiently before the disaster, uh, especially in relation to making those markets work for the poor. Um, thank you, thank you, John, for that question. Um, yes, I didn't touch on this in in the in my presentation, but the very the core of Emma is about comparing the uh, kind of before and after situation. So the the first step really is to map retrospectively what market system was like prior to the shock, and that and obviously understanding that is is one of the biggest aids to working out whether it's going to be capable of playing a, an adequate, sufficient role in the emergency response. Uh, if there was no market system prior to the emergency in that particular product, it's unlikely that it's going to suddenly exist, suddenly come into emergence when you inject a lot of uh, cash, for example, into the local economy. On the other hand, if, if you had a market prior to the crisis that was working pretty well, but has been uh, disabled by the uh, by the shock, then it's more plausible that, or more likely that you can, you know, reinvigorate it through various, you know, whatever kind of support is needed to get the, the market system functioning again. So, in short, uh, it's actually it's absolutely essential to the Emma analysis is this comparison of the baseline and the and the existing situation. And in, in that light, one one of the things that one would ideally have, of course, is prior kind of market profiles done of critical markets in vulnerable areas mm. as part of a sort of disaster, mm. uh, risk risk, disaster risk reduction strategy. Uh, you, would, you, know, you wouldn't have to go and find out you know, what the market was like before because you would, have, you would know that you know, this is a food insecure area and these kind of crises are possible and you would be doing that market profiling on a, hopefully on a regular basis. This is something that uh, I know FuseNet are very interested in uh, and other agencies would like to invest in, but it's, it's, uh, it's in the future. Uh, yeah, to, I mean, to add on that point, I think um, uh, it's something that we, we have already realized through the piloting is this, this idea of the pre, um, pre-EMMA or, or whatever, looking at markets prior to the disaster so that you've already got a baseline, it, particularly in areas that are prone to um, disasters of some kind. Um, we recognize that's another part of the, the next phase of Emma, the coming, coming phase. And we were very, very lucky in Haiti because FuseNet operates there, has great price information on um, particularly rice and beans. And there was some talk about encouraging them to look at um, construction materials in the same way that they look at food commodities, at least for a, a certain period of time when we know that construction materials are, are likely to... Um, be in greater demand than previously. So, yes, I think it's just Sorry. that. You, I don't think, uh, thank you for those answers, but you didn't quite uh, okay. answer the question about the concentration on the poor. It's mm -hmm. quite likely that the markets, even if they were working efficiently before, weren't working sufficiently well for the poorest members of that community. I'm just wondering if you're in your Emma. Um, toolkit, you try to work and build back better than was before, concentrating on the poor. I'm sorry, I'm using practical action jargon here, largely. Um, as you, I, I, you, may, you may know um, that within practical action this year, we're going to be focusing some resources on looking specifically at this issue of, of building back better and how we can incorporate Emma type analysis into strategies for disaster risk reduction. And so uh, that's very much our uh, organizational agenda. I don't know, it, it's probably not something that you would pick up directly from the toolkit, because for the sake of keeping the toolkit a manageable size, we, we had to you know, concentrate on the, the priorities as, I, as identified by the humanitarian agencies that commissioned it. But certainly, lots of agencies, including Practical Action, have seen the relationship between this kind of analysis and the kind of questions you're asking about how to build back better, how to make markets work for the poor in future. And of course, the toolkit is, is based on a, a Practical Action methodology that we use precisely for that uh, kind of objective in our long-term development work. 
I, th I think there's an issue as well of um, starting with do no harm. I mean, we know that a lot of the activities that we do have done harm to local economies. And so let's first stop that, <laughs> and then we can look at, you know, improving on that. But, uh, you know, I feel like that's part of the issue as well. Right. Laura. Thanks. I'm Laura Hammond from the School of Oriental and African Studies as well as uh, FEG Consulting. And I, my question is framed around something that, Carrie, you said, but perhaps actually Mike and Lily might be placed to respond to it, which is that you said um, that Emma is, some, is a kind of first response or a first line form of assessment um, and that HEA, Household Economy Analysis, is something that you would do <coughs> later on. And, and from what I know about Emma so far, um, seems to, one of the things that attracts me to it is the idea that in fact you can do these two kinds of analysis simultaneously mm -hmm. and that in fact Emma's gap analysis is a, in a very much a sense a kind of an abbreviated form of what HEA would do mm -hmm. in terms of looking at what's happening with livelihoods at the same time. But we know that uh, clearly some needs exist um, and develop outside of market dynamics and that's where HEA has a strength and, and of course there's the Emma market-oriented aspects as well. So, so I'm a little bit nervous about kind of, um, uh, kind of m making a linear progression kind of a model of use this first and then use this, um, and, and wanted to know what you thought about the complementarity of these two kinds of approaches. Mm -hmm. Should I respond and you can add in? Okay. Um, I think what I was just trying to say, we have the same sort of level of discomfort with cash because you might do an Emma and find that you should do cash, and you might find that you shouldn't. Um, and, and so I'm very sensitive to, to the issue overall. I think what I was trying to say is Emma only does what it does. It can't do everything. And we shouldn't assume that we have all the answers once you've finished the Emma. It's merely a, a way of being able to make better decisions earlier in the funding process um, and recognizing and flagging those things that then will need more attention ultimately. So, I mean. I, I, I think you've you probably answered answer the question, but <laughs> yes, they are complementary. They really are. And in fact, if we look back at the first ever iteration of EMMA, and in those days it was called RMAT, Rapid Market and Assessment Tool, um, we had a huge section in there which pretty, was, which pretty much was an assessment approach very similar to HEA, actually, the kind of livelihood groups and so forth. And then we, we came, to the, came to the conclusion that we should just take that out because the reality is that agencies will use their own assessment tools, their own way of assessing, be it HEA or, or something else, and then they can move on to EMMA quite nicely once they know what, what the needs were and what the priorities were, what the critical markets were. And that's why in EMMA, and Mike can probably tell you that the page, <laughs> when, you, when you start, um, I think it's step one or step two, it tells you what you need before you actually start the EMMA process. Mm. And what you need, there's a nice little checklist, what you'll need is understanding what your critical markets are based on your assessment approach, be it HA or something else, and so forth and so forth and so forth, and understanding who your, your target population are. So they're very complementary. In fact, I think, as Mike said, we stole a lot from the HA as well. Okay, now... Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, Miles Murray with uh, KUSA. Um, following up, a similar question to the one about Padang. Um, Lily, Lily highlighted at, uh, at the start that, that Emma was designed to inform responses. Um, and I was interested, therefore, to follow up on, on the recent Haiti assessment, for example, for, for shelter materials. Um, how much you've seen uh, either donors or agencies themselves uh, adapt, uh, uh, adapting their programs in response to the, to the findings that, that, for example, that people I think wanted contributions in kind? Um, I, uh, with specific regards to the shelter, I don't know the answer, and I think we're kind of waiting to see what comes out of the donor conference more specifically, uh, which is, what is the date of the do Haiti donor conference? Someone in this room must know. It's in March. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, we don't entirely have the answer to that, but that's one of the things that we're looking at now is how do we get a system in place to track then, then what happened a little bit. Um, you know, ultimately, it's the responsibility of different NGOs to take forward 
the activities that are appropriate for their you know, um, capacities and mandate and da da da. But we still kind of want to know so that we can answer questions like that. And we're working on it. <laughs> I, I know what Oxfam's doing, and uh, we're looking at the findings from the rice market in great detail and looking at ways in which Warehouses. we can work with, um, with the small, they're called boutiques, so the small kind of dukas, the small storeholders, and looking at issues around storage and so forth. So we're working with that. And um, is Alesh in the room? Yes, <laughs> OK. So maybe we should introduce you as well, because I think the work that you're going to be doing is going to be very important as well. As far as I understand, Alesh, you're doing a master's, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, and he's going to be going to Haiti to, again, to review how people have used Emma in Haiti, how they've, used, how they've uh, changed their programs or included Emma into their programming decisions. Like, and then what happened? And then what happened. And as you heard from Courtney as well, there's a second Emma planned in Jack Mel as well. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. And because it's a snapshot, again, you might want to look at your monitoring information and, and update it as you go along and change your decisions as you go along. Very interesting to yeah. Uh, back from that. that mm. Side. Mm. Yeah. And you know, those of you who are staying, you can also chat over sandwiches about uh, more of the details. Yes. My name is Maureen Law. I'm an engineer, so I have been working. It would be in the shelter and the wash cluster in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Uganda. So I have been implementing and I always try to buy locally and I mean having this attitude of enhancing the local market and there were innumerable problems uh, administrative, logistical, we, there was nobody to sign anything more than $2,000 that spot only at the capital so the consciousness was just not there I'm at Oxford Brooks doing a master's there at the moment and I want to pick uh, I picked that as dissertation, like how do you create this attitude that I think it's a mainstream thing, it's an attitude that you, you always look at the market. My question is, your tool is fantastic and it worked. So I'm wondering, <laughs> what, what, what is it that made it work? You know, when I was on your blog and I was just amazed, I was reading it every day and it was like when you were standing on the truck handing out hygiene kits <laughs> to the women these 97 people what did they say why did they come i mean what did you do there it worked with emma it worked what had been tried ages ago we can learn from that i don't even know <laughs> um why did it work i think honestly um it was because of the work that um, Lily and Mike and, and, and many others did um, before ever putting pen to paper to find out what was needed from agencies. What, what did NGOs want to be getting? And then the process, I mean, Lily said, it's been a three-year process. We've been talking about this for so long that people are starting to actually listen or getting bored and just listening to get us to shut up. I don't know. but. Um, I don't know. Why do you think people's attitudes have changed? And the buy-in, I think having so many agencies involved throughout the process has made it yeah. far easier for people to, to actually pick it up and use it. I mean, I think overall we've had, I don't know, 20, 30 agencies who've been checking in on Emma mm -hmm. over the three years, and probably about 15 of those or 10 of those have been very, very active in the pilots and so forth. Yeah, so I think the pilots help. They've got a vested interest in actually using the tool, which makes a big difference. Yeah, the, pilot, the pilots were when people really started to learn what, it, what the difference would be. Great. Um, okay, I just, we need to wrap up quite soon, but we've got a question here. Was there one over oh, here as well? Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I think you're out of my line of vision, so why don't you go first? I didn't put it up before. I was waiting for my time. You were just thinking it. Yeah, exactly. Thinking, when, when? Uh, my name's Claire McCarthy. I'm from Wings Like Eagles. Is this on? Is it working? Yeah, yes. good. Um, what I was late, and I haven't read the form, so I'm really new to all this, but just to say, is there facility when, when you have a disaster like Haiti and you go in and it's major, you know, you've got to get, you know, the time frame is tight. You've got to get in there and get helping people and saving lives, et cetera, et cetera. So is there a facility with Emma that you go in, 
you have a leader who coordinates all of you NGOs, so you know that you're all working together and supporting each other, so you're united, although you're coming in for different things. Is there any sort of system like that so that you can be more effective because you're united than if you're working separately, even though you've got the Emma tool and you're going in? You still need to be uni united. So you still need to have somebody come and say, right, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Let's hook you all together. And then you're working as a team together. And then if there's something that is not being dealt with, then you can look and say, well, we need someone to do that. And then that's pulled in and it's done together. And you're united. Is, is there that facility? Yeah, I was the team leader. Um, Lily helped, um, pr even prior to getting on the ground, Lily helped pull together who from various organizations was interested and ready to participate, either okay. on the ground or the organization was going to fly them in. Um, when I got on the ground, I then had that team already. So, okay. And they um, were prepped, I would say. Step one is, uh, you know, if you've all got this. So step one is essential preparation. And what that meant was make sure you've read tuck, 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 tuck reports, plus any other that you are aware of, please let us know. I mean, okay. there's an expectation when you do an Emma that people come prepared. Okay, and then the other thing I wanted to ask was a real something you mentioned when you stood up, and it was about how um, it's not cash involved, it's we have this, we can offer this, we can offer this. And I think that is very, very pertinent in society anyway, not just in something like this, where we all have skills, and it's not about, well, I'm going to charge you this, it's I will give you this, I will give you this, and you will give me this. And so as you go into Haiti and you help the local people, and they're in you know dire straits, that there's no holes barred. Everybody gives what they can of whatever their gifts are kind of thing. So that uh, help gets to where it needs to be in the time frame, quickly, quickly, quick, quickly. And I think that, that that really speaks to me that that it's not about money. It's about what we can offer the local people to get them back on their feet. Um, um, you know, I could bang on forever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to pick up on the... Um, sorry, the could you just identify Oh, yes, sorry. I'm Lucho Osorio. I work in practical action with uh, Mike and Alison Griffith next to me um, in the Markets and Livelihoods program. And I've had the, um, the privilege of experiencing the, um, the power of, of the market map that Mike presented previously in his, in his talk. And I think that that... Um, for me, has a big role in why Emma has worked or is working. Uh, what we have seen in the different projects where we have applied the market map in participatory market mapping workshops, uh, where different stakeholders come together to the same uh, room and start understanding how their market looks like and where the blockages are and the opportunities are, is that the power of that graphic representation mm -hmm. that draws the attention of the discussions in a, to a single point. I think from the learning perspective that has a huge implications and I would like to highlight that element because uh, probably it's, it goes unnoticed. Yeah. Um, and I think it has a big role in why Emma is working. Um, and, uh, and I think that Alish's research is going to help us understand and, and probably uh, test that hypothesis about what is the role of the, of the graphic representation, that mental model of the, of the market system in getting all of these uh, processes going. I'm really excited, uh, especially in terms of how do we get these kind of complex uh, concepts of market systems and markets in general um, <coughs> transfer to people who have not thought generally about this. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think that it's not only applicable in the humanitarian sector, but also for NGOs in general, uh, who are trying to convey mm -hmm. uh, concepts related to markets and market development to people who have never thought about this before. So it's really exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any final comments or questions before we close this part of the session and move over to our sandwiches and sign-up sheets? Yes. Hi, um, I'm 
Alison Griffith from Practical Action 2. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to follow on from what Lucho was saying. Instead, I would like to bring a question that I was asked um, in Khartoum about three weeks ago um, by some agencies who I was talking to about Emma. Um, I, I went to Sudan to spend some time with our program team. This was still warm from Practical Action Publishing, so um, I took it with me, and our director decided it would be a good idea to invite um, some of the agencies working in Darfur to um, come and talk to us about it. Slightly alarming for me, given that um, I'm not on the humanitarian side of things, but the development side of things. Luckily, Anita Albach, who Mike was talking about, um, who, who piloted it was, was there, so that was fantastic. But one of the things that the agencies um, asked me was, um, this toolkit is kind of build for sudden onset emergencies, um, but many uh, organizations are working in more protracted um, situations. Obviously, they're in the very tricky situation in, in Darfur, and um, they were extremely enthusiastic about having a tool like this and wanted to know a little bit about its applicability in that type of situation. Should we let them answer first? Or? Yeah, okay. And then we'll have to close, yeah. Uh, well, Alison, I, <laughs> I, th I think as agencies in Khartoum have discovered that it's not only um, sudden onset situations where this kind of analysis seems to be in demand. We designed the toolkit for sudden onset situations on the assumption that this is situations where you don't have time to find a, an expert to come in and analyze the markets. And I suppose that one question that, that, that goes begging is why in a protracted chronic situation agencies aren't doing this kind of analysis with people who are market experts. Um, but given that that apparently doesn't happen, <laughs> or at least not very often, <laughs> actually, that's not true. It, it is happening. Um, it is happening increasingly. There are actually um, other toolkits um, that are being developed for those kind of situations, particularly, the, the, I should mention, the Mifira toolkit, which yeah. has been developed by uh, Chris Barrett and CARE, for, specifically for looking at food insecure regions and markets. But. Um, this is one of the agendas for developing, you know, for broadening the scope of Emma and toolkits like Emma is to inculcate the market analysis, market analytical thinking into uh, chronic food insecure and other chronic crisis situations. Final. I'm a learner and a teacher, very much interested in using graphical representation for problem solving, and I have been reading how hospitals, Sorry. social services have been using it very effectively. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. I think we're finished then. But I wanted to thank you all for, for coming and to those who are listening online for tuning in and to our presenters, Mike, uh, Lily, and Carrie, and the, the agencies they, they represent. <coughs> so thank you very much for coming. I hope you'll stay with us and come next door. I'm not quite sure. There's a door that opens out there, and we'll work that out. But there are sandwiches, things to drink on the other side, and we can carry on the conversation. Of course, if you want to get your very own copy of Emma, you can uh, buy it next door. Thank you very much.